Welcome to our second episode on proteins and nucleic acids. In this episode, we're going to cover three slides of this keynote presentation. And we're, first, we're going to go over some of the basics, like what's the dimer, what's the polymer of a protein. And then we're going to cover what are the levels of protein organization. There's four different levels. And then finally, we're going to go over the seven functions of proteins. A very important episode because of these seven functions. You want to make sure that you know those definitely for sure. Well, let's begin out with something a little bit easier. If you recall from an earlier screencast, we talked about monomers, polymers, uh, and dimers, and how these were all built together through dehydration synthesis, an anabolic process, and then how they would be broken through hydrolysis, which is a catabolic process. So we're just going to apply that knowledge to proteins. And first we want to start off with a dipeptide. Di is a prefix that simply means two. Peptide is a fancy word that, re that refers to amino acids. It simply means two amino acids joined together. The peptide part comes from the bond that joins amino acids together, that peptide bond. Poly, as you remember, is a prefix that means many. And for us, many means three or more, so three, three plus. Now, polypeptides or proteins, I want you to remember, proteins and polypeptides are synonymous. A polypeptide and a protein, same thing. Most of the ones in your body are at least 300 amino acids long. So think of a train that has 300 cars attached to it. That's a very, very large molecule. In fact, when we talk about biomolecules, we can call them organic macromolecules. The prefix macro means big, so these are big molecules. Something that has 300 things chained together, that's pretty big. All right, now this statement down here is something really important. You want to make sure that you really remember what's going on with this. What determines a protein's function? Its shape and its structure. Shape determines the function. And what determines the shape? Now let's get rid of that mark. The shape is determined by the amino acid sequence. So let me get caught up here. So it's, de oops, it's determined by amino acid sequence. Remember that train car we're talking about here? It had 300 of them. You can put those trains in pretty much any order. Now obviously you're going to have the engine at the front and the caboose at the back. But those other 290 cars, they can be arranged in any kind of order. And depending on what arrangement it is, that's going to determine the shape of that protein. So let's see how that happens. When we talk about the levels of protein structure, we're really talking about how does a protein get its shape. And remember, shape determines the function of a protein. These have really, really hard names, so I really want you to make sure you pay attention to this. Primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary, and quaternary. And these are way too many letters for us to write, so we're going to call them one degree symbol for primary, two degree symbol for secondary, Tertiary, which is a fancy word that means third area, is a three degree symbol, and there's no such thing as fourth area, so we call it quaternary, four degree symbol. This primary one is the most important because primary simply means the amino acid sequence. And once again, remember, this will determine what happens in the secondary, what happens in the tertiary structure, and what happens in the quaternary structure. The primary structure makes all three of these other ones happen. The secondary structure is an amino acid chain that will cause coils, which are also known as a helix, and folds, whoops, which are also known as a pleat. Pleat, just a fancy name for a fold. So a coil or a helix will kind of look like a telephone cord. See how it makes those coils? And then a pleat will be folds. So think of like you made a paper fan like you may have done in elementary school or something. Okay, in the tertiary structure, the secondary structure, remember these helixes and pleats or cold or sorry, coils or folds, they're actually going to fold back on top of themselves. So think of like you had a phone cord and then you just bent it back on itself. Or you had a bunch of folds and you just bent it backwards on itself. That's a tertiary structure. You're taking it and you're changing its shape. You're folding it on top of each other. Quaternary refers to the addition of another polypeptide. So think of like you had a white phone cord and then you wadded it up with a black phone cord. 
that would be your quaternary structure. All right, so if you didn't like the explanations that I have here, I want you to focus over here on this picture. See these beads on a string? Each bead represents an, an individual amino acid. And depending on what order that these guys are, that's going to determine what happens on this one. So this is a picture that represents your primary structure. Here you have your secondary structure. Remember, two degree symbol. And this is your pleated sheet or the folds. And this is your alpha helix, which is a coil. Now in your tertiary structure, you're going to take your folds and your coils and you're going to bend them back on each other. So look closely right in here. See how it's got a fold? And this fold actually bends backwards and has a coil on top of it. So we can mix these two up in our tertiary structure. In our quaternary structure, we've added a new polypeptide. So this is basically a picture of a hemoglobin molecule. And if you remember from another episode, we had an alpha chain. That's a Greek letter. And then we had a beta chain. And these two guys are starting to basically hold together really by a lot of hydrogen bonds and some other things called a sulfide bridge. And that's your globular protein. Basically, it's a big glob of protein. That's your quaternary structure. Okay, everything in here is in color. Make sure you study and remember this stuff. All right, what are the functions of a protein? Now, I, I kind of wish that I would have rearranged these before I made this keynote because I had a brainstorm and I had a great way for you to remember what these seven steps are. Our mnemonic device or our little memory thing is escape time. That would be like the escape key on your keyboard in the upper left-hand corner. And then the word time. So if we look at the first letter of all these in color, we can create a mnemonic device or an acronym, escape time. The E refers to energy, the S to structure, and the C to chemical messengers. The T refers to transport, the I for immunity, the M for movement, and an E for enzymes. So let's look at these all in more detail. Energy source. Uh, most animals, like humans and other mammals, we don't really use protein as an energy source. We'd rather use a carbohydrate or a lipid. But under stress, when our body doesn't have carbohydrates available to it or lipids, we will begin to break down our own muscles as an energy source. So it's like, it's like a place of last resort. So think of like anything through history or on the news where you saw somebody basically starving through famine, war, or just, you know, genocide like you would have saw in the Holocaust or something. So if you think of like World War II history, when uh, the Holocaust death camps were liberated and the survivors looked like they were skin and bones, because they kind of were. Their body had already digested every carbohydrate that was available to them. It also began to digest all of their body fat. And they were out of that, so now it was beginning to break down their muscles. So they didn't have very many muscles left. So you're pretty close to dying from starvation when you start to break down your muscles. All right, structure, basically a fancy word for shape. So how does a cell keep its shape? Well, it's going to do that through an interconnecting network of two types of proteins. First one is called microtubules. Micro simply means small, and tubules means tubes and microfilaments. Micro means small again, but filaments just means thread. So what we have here, we have a network of tiny tubes and tiny threads, and they form a scaffolding that will make up what's called the cytoskeleton. Cyto is a word that refers to cell. So this would be the skeleton of the cell. And just like your skeleton does, gives you shape and support, this is what this network of microtubules and microfilaments does for a cell. It gives it shape. Okay, for movement, think of your muscles. Your muscles use two proteins. One's called actin, one called myosin. And these two proteins will slide back and forth when your muscles contract. So this will be a contraction, and this would be relaxation. So if you, you know, you bend your biceps like this, those actin and myosin molecules are sliding across from each other. Transport, we've already talked about a little bit. Think about your blood, your red blood cells. They use an, en or an enzyme, let me rephrase this. They use a protein called hemoglobin to carry oxygen. We cover that in a previous uh, episode. Chemical messengers. Another name for a chemical messenger is a hormone. Hormones are chemicals that are made in one part of the body and they are transported to another to make something happen. Insulin would be an example of a hormone that causes 
Insulin would be made in your pancreas, but it regulates the level of sugar in your blood. Totally different place. Immunity, your immune system. How do you keep from getting diseases again? Well, one of the most important proteins in your immune system is called an antibody. Antibodies are Y-shaped proteins that will cling to a germ. So I'm going to draw a germ right here. I'm going to say it's a virus, like cold virus, okay? The antibody will cling to it like this. And, you know, maybe there will be two on this one. Right? This is like a marking for a white blood cell to come along and eat this thing. So this one here has been marked for death. It'll be taken care of. It can't make you sick anymore, and your immune system is going to eat it. And I've saved for the last, by far, the number one job of proteins. In fact, these are so important that if we didn't have these in our body, we couldn't survive. And these are called enzymes. Enzymes are what we call a biological catalyst. A catalyst is any substance that will speed up a chemical reaction. Let me get caught up here. Oops, I almost forgot to spell up. And I'm just going to say reacts for reaction. Okay, the chemicals, the chemistry that happens in your body is extremely complicated. And these molecules have to be moved and, and put in a certain position. Now, the only way this happens naturally is if these molecules are moving really, really fast and they slam into each other just right. Well, the only th way to get those molecules in your body moving that fast is to light you on fire. And that's not going to be good for you because that will kill you. So in order to make these chemical reactions occur at an energy level that's a lot less than being on fire, that's going to be done by these enzymes and these catalysts. These guys are really, 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 really important. Okay? We have a future chapter where we're going to go over how enzymes do what they do, but we're going to save that one right around chapters uh, 8 and 9. We'll get those a little bit closer to Christmas. Okay, Thanksgiving, that area. All right, that's going to wrap up this episode. I really want you to make sure that you studied the previous slide on this keynote presentation. What were the levels of structure? Remember, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. You need to know those for a test and a quiz. And I also want you to know these. These are real important. What are the functions of the proteins? These guys are really important. Without proteins, we don't really survive very well as living things. So all living things that are made up of cells, even bacteria, uh, single-celled organisms, of course, multicellular creatures like us and plants, we all have proteins that do the things that we need to do chemically so that we can survive. All right. We have one more episode in this series, so until that one, we'll catch you on the flip side.